Thanks. Um, welcome everybody to the Advancing Healthcare Equity Speaker Series. Uh, today we have uh, Kamisha Russell, who is uh, an assistant professor of philosophy at um, the University of Oregon and the author of The Assisted Reproduction of Race. Um, and today she's going to be talking to us about what makes an anti-racist feminist bioethics. Um, welcome, we're so glad you're part of this series. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Um, so what makes a feminist bioethics anti-racist? When we think about what makes an approach to bioethics feminist, we might look for four different but interrelated elements. One, that it concerns itself with patients or subjects who identify as women, as transmasculine or as gender non-binary. Two, that it concerns itself with sexism, gender discrimination or androcentrism, that's focus on men in biomedicine. Three, that it concerns itself with the way that categories like sex and gender are understood, taken up or reinforced um, by and within medical, biomedical practices. And or four, that it explicitly employs explicitly feminist theories, frameworks or methods in its analysis. So analogously, we might argue that in order to be anti-racist, an approach within feminist bioethics must contain one or more different but interrelated elements. One, that it concerns itself with patients or subjects who identify both as women, as transmasculine, or as gender non-binary, and as non-white. Two, that it concerns itself both with sexism, gender discrimination, or androcentrism in biomedicine, and with the intersections of, with race, racial discrimination, or white ethnocentrism therein. Three, that it concerns itself both with the way that categories like sex and gender are understood, taken up, or reinforced by and within biomedical practices, and with the way those categories themselves are always already racialized. And or four, that it explicitly employs feminist theories, frameworks, or methods in its analysis that are themselves explicitly intersectional and or anti-racist. While not all feminist bioethics is anti-racist, all feminist bioethics could and should be anti-racist. While anti-racism is, racism is never easily achieved within academic, institutional, and broadly social contexts that are deeply racist, there is no gendered subject of feminist bioethical inquiry that is not also racialized, even or perhaps especially when that subject is racialized as white. Thus, all feminist bioethics is theoretically capable of addressing this pervasive racialization in its research and theorizing. Similarly, all discussion of race in bioethics could be feminist. And of course, all bioethic, bioethical work, full stop, could be both feminist and anti-racist, but let's not try to gallop straight out of the gate. So here's a quick outline uh, for the talk. I'll talk about how bioethicists should understand race. I'll talk about intersectionality and why it's important for this. Uh, I'll go over some key bioethical issues for women and gender non-binary people of color. And then I'll talk about reproductive justice as an example of coalitional bioethical work. And then you will, there'll be time for questions. Okay, so it's worth making explicit at the outset how I think all bioethicists should understand the concept of race. Scientists have sometimes been called upon to pass judgment in ethical or political debates about race by proving or disproving the scientific, biological, or genetic basis of the concept. However, I argue that bioethicists should not place their focus on the falsity or truth of the race concept. It is certainly fair to say that current scientific consensus completely discredits the idea that racialized differences in phenotype correspond either with significant differences in terms of the human genome or with significant differences in intelligence, physical ability, or moral character. In other words, the, the scientific consensus is that race as we know it doesn't exist biologically. It is also fair to say, however, that many people, including some scientists, continue to act as if race possesses the sort of reality that can be discovered or observed in nature. Thus, I argue that bioethical engagement with the concept of race must include a recognition of and reckoning with the social resilience of the con race concept. And this is something I, I, I hear you've read um, my uh, race idea and reproductive technologies article. So some of this should uh, look familiar, but it will, it will diverge soon. Um, race is better understood, of course, as socially constructed and as having the same sort of reality as other socially constructed things like money. 
The value artificially assigned to precious metals, physical currency, and electronic records of capital and debt cannot easily be changed by any individual at will. So too, the meaning and value associated with certain physical characteristics and other markers of racial identity within a society remain largely beyond the control of individual identity holders. That is, I cannot declare myself white within society any more than I can declare myself a billionaire, though under the right conditions, I might try to pass for either one. And it is these identities largely beyond our control that determine our susceptibility or relative immunity to racism, which Ruth Gilmore aptly defines as the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. This is the second crucial requirement for bioethical engagement with the race concept. One must understand that a racialized embodiment leaves certain people vulnerable to the direct or indirect health effects of racial discrimination. Direct effects include the negative health effects of chronic stress caused by consistent experiences of discrimination and inferior treatment by healthcare providers due to racial stereotypes. Indirect effects include the negative health impacts linked to low socioeconomic status, itself linked to minority status, like increased exposure to pollution and toxins, reduced access to healthy food, and chronic stress related to worry about money or exposure to violence, including state violence. In other words, rather than worrying about what race is biologically, bioethicists must worry about what race does to the body. Much of Michel Foucault's work involves uncovering and delineating what he calls regimes of truth, which means not declaring any particular regime false or misguided, but rather exposing both the ideas and assumptions that characterize a particular regime of truth and the concrete means, instruments, rules, and practices through which that regime of truth emerges, is sustained, and is maintained. In this vein, to engage in anti-racist work, bioethicists must understand race, as I have described it elsewhere, as a sort of non-existent yet very much real object established and continually re-established through a set of practices emerging from and upholding particular regimes of truth and serving particular political functions that are nevertheless disguised by the way in which rules and practices surrounding race act as if it exists. This means both recognizing the negative health effects of racism and becoming aware of the way that white ethnocentrism has shaped and continues to shape both biomedicine and bioethics itself. For feminist bioethics, anti-racist work can begin with recognition both of the importance of intersectionality or similar theoretical concepts to anti-racist feminist theory and of the importance of the perspectives of women of color on any feminist bioethical issue. While the definition of intersectionality is frequently and often productively contested, we might establish a working understanding of the theory by elaborating its key insights, motivations, and demands. As Kimberly Crenshaw's seminal metaphor establishes, intersectionality recognizes that it's possible to be situated at the intersection of two or more marginalized identities, and that when one is so situated, it will not be possible to disentangle the two or more forms of discrimination that acted to produce an experience of injustice. Thus, for example, when considering the disproportionate incidence of low birth rate in infants uh, born to Black women in the US, which seems to be attributable to chronic stress over the life course, it will not be possible to separate out the percentage of stress that comes from being black from that that comes from being a woman. Moreover, intersectionality as a theory rejects an additive approach to oppression. Mm -hmm. That is the chronic stress that accompanies being a black woman in the US is not the stress of being black plus the stress of being a woman. The stress of being a black woman instead emerges from the particular structural locations black women occupy and from the particular stereotypes or controlling images through which much of America perceives and responds to black women. For example, a pregnant black woman seeking healthcare doesn't simply encounter two sets of stereotypes. One at, that as black, she will be irrational and non-compliant and another that as a woman, she does not know what is best for herself and will overreport her pain level. She also encounters stereotypes specific to black women that she is gaming the system to receive care she hasn't paid for and does not deserve, or that the life of her child is already less valuable than that of other children, since the child will probably grow up poor and without a father, and since the mother probably has too many children already. Further still, the inter intersectionality resists assumptions that any two people who appear to lie at the same intersection of identities will share the same essential experiences. <clears throat> 
not only are identity, identity categories numerous, for example, not just race and gender, but also class, sexuality, disability, age, color, ethnicity, et cetera, but they combine with families, geographies, temperaments, and individual experiences. Moreover, what is at issue is the operation of power in and through these various identities. These operations are multiplicitous and shifting and do not act on any two individuals on, in the exact same way. These key insights emerge from and structure the motivations of those who take or work from intersectional approaches. There is, for many, a desire to make legible experiences of marginalization and injustice that are often rendered illegible by the very analytical tools one would expect to illuminate them. Thus the arresting title, all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave. When white women are seen as the leaders and beneficiaries of feminism and black men are seen as the leaders and beneficiaries of anti-racist struggle, black women are not simply left to become passive beneficiaries, but, are oft but often find their particular needs and concerns theoretically obscured and materially unaddressed. The desire to make legible is thus not simply an academic point, but rather one that emerges from and continues in the service of advocacy and act activism. As a theory, intersectionality does not just observe and critique, it intervenes and seeks to transform. And it demands non-intersectional approaches to issues of social justice are not just incomplete, they are dangerous. While not additive, different structures of power and oppression are co-constitutive and mutually supportive. If they're not acknowledged and addressed together, there's great risk of worsening injustice at, uh, injustices at one location while attempting to alleviate them at another. This makes intersectionality crucial for any project seeking to address inequalities and injustices, but it is particularly crucial for bioethics because bioethical issues are embodied issues and so many forms of discrimination rely on social perceptions of one's embodiment and the meanings that embodiment is thought to entail. In white colonial and settler colonial states, no researcher, nor subject, nor doctor, nor patient appears in any biomedical context without a gendered and racialized set of experiences and embodiment, to say nothing of the many other bodily markers that are taken to signal other forms of difference. Moreover, research on issues like chronic stress, epigenetics, and intergenerational trauma demonstrates how perceptions of one's inferior embodiment can actually compromise one's embodied health and well being. And in fact, medical interventions often seek to serve to, or serve to alter one's embodiment, sometimes with the aim of restoration to an earlier state of one's own health, but other times with the goal of bringing one's embodiment into greater conformity with norms modeled on the ideal of a white, able-bodied, neurotypical, heterosexual, cisgendered man. While feminist bioethics is constitutionally concerned with the embodiment and biomedical concerns of women and ideally gender non-binary individuals, without due attention to and solicitation of perspectives from a variety of women and non-binary people of color, it will always be at risk of one, missing important problems, two, failing to identify the most promising solutions, three, failing to meet the needs of those in greatest need, and for reinforcing the very structure it seeks to critique and transform. All right, so now I will move to the key bioethical issues for women and, and, gen, uh, women and gender non-binary people of color. Okay, so historical patterns of reproductive experimentation and abuse. To understand the way women of color may approach biomedicine in general and reproductive biomedicine in particular, it is important to understand the history of reproductive experimentation and abuse to which they and their foremothers were subjected. Lucy and Arca and Betsy, along with eight other unnamed enslaved black women, endured dozens of vaginal surgeries without anesthesia, though often doled by and addicted to morphine afterwards, in order for Marion Sims to practice the techniques which would earn him the honorific father of modern gynecology. While these enslaved black women were considered enough alike white women that techniques practiced on them could later be used on white patients, they were not believed to experience pain the way white women did and were considered hardy enough to endure multiple procedures. Nor were they thought to have modesty in need of respect or protection. There was nothing too untoward for Sims about asking his medical students to assist him in inserting a pewter spoon into Lucy's vagina, forerunner to Sims' speculum, to better view her fistula. 
Later, during the first half of the 20th um, century, as part of a, its colonial project in Puerto Rico, the US established a network of maternal and reproductive health clinics. While doing little to improve the reproductive health of Puerto Rican women, these clinics offered convenient access to clinical trial subjects for population activists, researchers, and physicians who implemented a Wild West standard of medical research on the island, using Puerto Rican women to test various forms of birth control, including the pill, Depo-Provera, contraceptive foam, and the intrauterine device. Here again, racialized assumptions, in this case, a belief that areas inhabited by people of color are inherently overpopulated and that their populations are incapable of regulating their own reproduction, serve as convenient justifications for placing the needs of biomedicine above the needs of women of color. Aside from their role as non-consenting and disposable research subjects, a role which black men infamously found themselves during the Tuskegee syphilis study, Women of color from a variety of marginalized communities have been targeted for, co for coercive and abusive forms of reproductive control in the name of the public good. Returning to Puerto Rico, by 1965, over 34% of Puerto Rican mothers aged 20 to 49 had been sterilized. By 1980, the country had the highest rate of female sterilization in the world. In the Puerto Rican case, these women allegedly chose sterilization. But as Gutierrez and Fuentes describe in the colonial context, quote, coercion, a lack of proper informed consent, the lack of birth spacing or pregnancy prevention methods, a political economy that created poverty and joblessness, and a state interest in promoting population control colluded to make sterilization desirable. Desirable. Yet within the American mainland history of forced and coerced domestic sterilizations, even this level of constrained choice was frequently absent. Originally written and litigated for use on poor rural whites like Carrie Buck, US sterilization laws and policies came to be used against a variety of women of color, including Mexican origin, Black, and Native American women. Justifications for these sterilizations and other coercive programs of birth control tied to welfare and other forms of public assistance both rely on and perpetuate stereotypes of women of color as hypersexual, weak willed, and excessively fertile and as corrupting influences on their own children. Such policies are designed to send a message to the broader society that poor women of color, poor people of color overburden state resources by bearing too many illegitimate children. Then if and when women of color attempt to resist reproductive control disguised as help, they can be blamed for perpetuating a culture of poverty. In this way, the deep structural causes of perpetual poverty in communities of color are ignored and allowed to go unaddressed. So second uh, issue, contemporary racial disparities in health access and outcomes. So these histo uh, historical issue and contemporary issues in reproduction and the stereotypes that under underlying them are ever present when a woman of color interacts with the health uh, care system and healthcare practitioners. Awareness of these issues as they pertain to particular populations of women in the US or any other multiracial country, an awareness one might term structural competency is crucial to addressing current inequalities in healthcare access and health outcomes. The fourth edition of the Women of Color Health Data Book, uh, published by the US National Institutes of Health in 2014, provides an overview of different patterns of health disparities and health determinants among stratified populations within US women of color based on US census categories. Among the groups discussed in the data book, non-Hispanic black women stand out in a variety of troubling ways. They have lower life expectancies than their white or Latina counterparts and are much more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than mothers of any other racial or ethnic group. Similarly, infants born to black women are much more likely to die than infants of women in any other group. So this is um, one example. Uh, this is a graph that shows uh, how black women are exceptions to the usual correlation between greater wealth or education and greater health. So normally the wealthier or more educated someone is, the better their health, um, including their birth outcomes would be. But what you see here is that white infant mortality rates are generally going down for white women as they advance in terms of education. They're the blue, um, but they're actually uh, fluctuating and often going up for black women as they advance in terms of education. So that by the time you're comparing white and black PhDs or other professionals, there's this tremendous gap 
in um, infant mortality rates, which is what you see at the lowest line. Okay, so despite comprising only 13% of the female population in 2010, Black women accounted for 64% of new HIV infections and had the highest death rates from HIV disease among all women. And more than half of Black women were obese in the same time period compared to one third of white women. Along with Black women, American Indian and Alaska Native women present one of the most disturbing pictures. Though this group of women is quite internally diverse, the data books argues that their shared histories of forced removal from ancestral homelands, brutal colonization, and confi confinement to reservations offer some reasonable justification for considering their health disparities and determinants as a group. Among health and healthcare access disparities in these communities directly tied to that history of racism and discrimination, the data book includes the lack of federal funding for the Indian Health Service, IHS, and the long difference between IHS distance between IHS facilities, low self-esteem, and high rates of poverty and unemployment. The latter in particular fosters reliance on government commodity foods that are high in both fat and calories, which increases obesity and community risk of diabetes. Not only is the rate of diabetes in the American Indian slash Alaska Native population twice that of the general US population, but the death rate from diabetes mellitus is nearly twice that, uh, twice that for whites. So the effects of racism, poverty, and unemployment are also visible in the high occurrences of alcoholism, substance abuse, mental health disorders, suicide, and violence in American Indian Alaska Native communities. Moreover, sincere and comprehensive attempts to address these problems, were they to be funded and undertaken, would likely be hampered by the highly rational, that is highly rational distrust that these communities have of the US government, US healthcare officials, US health systems, and US researchers, all based on histories of dishonesty, mistreatment, disregard, and neglect. It is also important to note that in 2011, on the whole, women of color comprised 30% of the US female population, but 56% of uninsured women in the US putting access to many forms of healthcare financially out of reach. If healthcare providers lack the structural competency to take these factors and other factors specific to other women of color groups into account when working with members of marginal, marginalized populations, they risk falling back on racist stereotypes which regard higher incidences of various health issues as a result of personal or cultural failings of the patients on the patient's part and poor outcomes as the result of non-compliance with medical recommendations. Okay, so the third uh, issue, I, uh, set of issues I have is issues related to incarceration. So an anti-racist feminist bioethics must also pay close attention to the disproportionate incarceration of people of color and the way this incarceration intersects with health and reproductive injustices. Focusing on women of color, we can talk about two types of impact. One, the health impact on women of color of the incarceration of family and community members. So where the women are not incarcerated, but their family or community members are. And two, the health impact on women of color of their own incarceration. So Maxwell and Solomon detail the emotional and financial burdens often borne by women when a loved one is incarcerated. Financially, not only is uh, any income provided by the recently incarcerated person lost, but nearly half of adults with incarcerated family members actually support the incarcerated person financially during and or after their sentence. In fact, women constitute 83% of those responsible for incarcerated family members' court-related costs and typically pay more than $13,000 in fines and fees alone. Moreover, 34% 30 of affected families incur debt just to cover phone calls and visits. The, this financial burden makes it hard to meet basic needs like food, housing, clothing, and transportation. Emotionally, even this indirect contact with the criminal justice system reverberates for women of color in the form of heightened risk for PTSD, anxiety, and depression. Based off new analysis and existing evidence, Maxwell and Solomon argue that the toxic stress from contact with the criminal justice system has contributed to the disparities in rates of black and white infant mortality, which is what we saw on the slide. So, the, um, so these researchers are saying that specifically this uh, stress from contact with the criminal justice system is, is worsening um, you know, th this disparity 
uh, in, in infant mortality. With experts estimating that infant mortality rates today would be 7.8% lower, and that disparities between black and white women would be 15% smaller if incar incarceration rates had remained at 1970s levels. So while mass incarceration affects a much greater percentage of men of color than women of color, the number of incarcerated women has increased more than seven times since 1980, a growth rate much higher than that of incarcerated men. While the rates of incarceration for African-American women have been decreasing since 2000, as of 2019, their rate of imprisonment was still 1.7 times that of white women. Latinx women are, imp are imprisoned at 1.3 times the rate of white women, though the imprisonment of white women has been increasing in the past two decades. Though obviously matching by decreasing would be the better option. We don't really want white women to catch up by being more imprisoned. Um, so direct contact with the criminal justice system carries significant health consequences. With incarceration comes increased risks of sexual violence and infectious illness, loss of connection with family and friends, and trauma from cruel prison policies and practices. The long-term the the long physiological effects of incarceration also contribute to a range of health issues, including mental health disorders, diabetes, asthma, hypertension, HIV, and hepatitis C. While well, 86% of incarcerated women are survivors of past sexual violence, they are still subject to triggering procedures like cavity searches, pat downs, and shackling. Most jails and prisons also lack adequate menstrual hygiene products and gynecological and obstetric care. More than half of women in state prisons have a child under the age of 18. Despite most of these women acting as primary caretakers of their children prior to incarceration, Half are confined in facilities located more than 100 miles from their families, and more than one third will not see their children even once while incarcerated. If children are placed in foster care, incarcerated mothers risk never getting them back, even if they are able to demonstrate the ability to care for them upon release. As Maxwell and Solomon note, Black mothers are already far more likely to report depression than the general population. These stressors only exacerbate this persistent problem. And in the longer piece, I also talk about pregnant women in prison, um, but I decided to, to leave that out for the sake of time. Okay, so the next uh, section is um, on issues facing trans and gender non-binary women of color. Citing a series of studies from the last two decades, Hill et al. find a growing body of evidence that shows that trans women of color carry a disproportionately high burden of adverse social and economic outcomes, including high rates of unemployment, homelessness, limited access to health care, stigma, discrimination, victimization, homicide, and difficulty accessing gender-affirming medical services, that is, transition-related counseling and hormone therapies, for example. Each of these factors can trigger or compound the others, and all would need to be addressed simultaneously to ensure just outcomes. But for the purposes of our discussion of an anti-racist feminist bioethics, the questions of stigma and discrimination in healthcare merit special focus. So in a 2015 survey, 36% of transgender women reported negative experiences with their healthcare provider. In fact, among these transgender women who talked about their gender with their provider, one in five experienced a provider trying to stop them from being transgender. Even when a provider does not explicitly try to convert a patient to the sex they were assigned at birth, negative assumptions, judgment, and discrimination can be conveyed by verbal and nonverbal cues like body language, tone of voice, demeanor, or the repeated use of incorrect pronouns. In some cases, problems uh, in the provider-patient provider relationship stem from discordant prioritization of healthcare issues, with many transgender patients prioritizing hormone therapy and their providers prioritizing other health issues. As Magnus et al. write, quote, over a lifetime, negative experiences of being misgendered in healthcare settings, stigmatized during triage, or having to educate providers about your unique healthcare needs often drives trans women to avoid healthcare until extreme or emergency scenarios. Indeed, a 2011 study found that 61% of transgender participants had chosen to delay or completely avoid accessing medical care due to fear of gender identity related discrimination in healthcare settings. Other relevant difficulties that trans people of color face include a higher HIV risk than the general population, even their white trans counterparts, 
resulting in part from economic marginalization and an increased need to participate in the underground economy for survival. The 2015 US transgender survey found that nearly one in five, 19% of black transgender women were living with HIV and American Indian 4.6% and Latina 4.4% uh, transgender women were more likely, more than three times as likely to be living with HIV as the overall sample. So transgender patients may also experience hesitance to seek healthcare services due to a lack of identification documents co concordant with their gender identity or having utilized healthcare services, they may encounter billing systems which require concordance between listed sex and anatomy to allow for billing of sex specific procedures. So they're both uh, discrimination in uh, you know, prevent provider relationships and there are bureaucratic and insurance based um, forms of exclusion. It is also worth noting that an increasing number of people um, identify themselves as genderqueer and or non-binary. Their challenges in accessing healthcare may be both similar to and distinct from those faced by trans people. In a 2016 international study, uh, these uh, genderqueer and, not, or, and or non binary respondents showed significantly worse self reported health and ge worse general well being in comparison to binary trans respondents, suggesting the need for, a, for a spe specifically non binary inclusive healthcare environments. One promising program for improving access to and provision of healthcare to trans patients involved the use of peer health consultants who provided direct referrals, not only to trusted healthcare services, but also to urgent social services, including housing, legal, and educational resources. Addressing these survival needs first made space for addressing health needs. Moreover, emerging findings suggest that not only is transgender inclusive care vital to physical health, but that it may also have a protective function in terms of mental health. Okay, and this is the last of the issues um, that I am highlighting this talk, um, which is environmental injustice. So the de definitions of environmental injustice and environmental racism are contested in terms of what exactly they name and encompass. For our purposes here, I interpret them broadly. Uh, thus, following Dorsetta Taylor, we might say uh, we might take the term environmental racism to describe processes resulting in quote minority and low income communities facing disproportionate environmental harms and limited environmental benefits. Under this umbrella, we might then consider at least four broad and overlapping ways in which people of color find themselves living in environments that are hazardous to their health. First, and perhaps most traditionally for the idea of environmental racism, there's the likelihood that poor people and people of color will find their communities targeted for the placement of waste disposal and other environmentally hazardous sites or a polluting industries. Teresa Benz, for example, identifies some of the numerous studies that have found race to be the strongest predictor of exposure and proximity to environmental hazards. She also notes considerable evidence of a direct link between racial segregation, exposure to environmental hazards and poor health outcomes. Kyle White gives the example of the Amajiwanang uh, First Nation of 850 members that is situated within 25 kilometers of 62 major industrial facilities from oil refineries to manufacturing in a region often called Chemical Valley which is near Sarnia, Ontario. See, these are the things that you don't realize until you read it for the first time out loud. You're like, oh, I don't have any idea how to pronounce that name. So my apologies on that. I will look that up the next time I give a talk about this. Um, so second, uh, marginalized communities and in particular indigenous communities have often been forced off their traditional lands, relocated to lands with fewer resources and then relocated again if previously unrecognized resources are discovered on the lands they were forced to occupy. This leaves such communities impoverished, sometimes with limited water access and often with substantially reduced means of subsistence to sustain healthy traditional diets. Yet the existential damage of these, these dislocations, as my earlier mention of mental health and substance abuse issues suggests, runs much deeper. As White describes, quote, settler colonialism can be interpreted as a form of environmental injustice that wrongfully interferes with and erases the socio-ecological context required for indigenous populations to experience the world as a place infused with responsibilities to humans, non-humans, and ecosystems. 
Third, similarly, but in the urban rather than rural context, marginalized communities and in particular black communities have often been funneled into urban housing projects, which aside from being often, uh, from, from often being located in, the, in areas of less economic value and or adjacent to industry or major transportation corridors have often been characterized by poor construction, poor building code, and code enforcement and poor maintenance. These unsafe housing environments increase exposure to environmental toxicants and home allergens, which contribute to health issues like asthma or lead poisoning, especially in children. Finally, in both the urban and rural contexts, marginalized communities may, by a combination of market forces and government neglect, both fueled by underlying racism, lack proximate access to a number of goods and resources required for the maintenance of health or a healthy lifestyle. Among these lacking goods and resources may be large supermarkets with low prices, since convenience liquor and small grocery stores tend to offer a more limit, limited selection of healthful foods at higher prices, um, a, a, lack of, a lack of pharmacies and a lack of safe outdoor spaces for recreation and exercise. As Lee et al. note, uh, people tend to make dietary choices based on the quality of food that is available and economical. Even if one's individual socioeconomic status is higher than one's neighbors, simply living in a deprived neighborhood is associated with eating fewer fruits and vegetables and more foods high in fat. Environmental racism and environmental justice work are of particular interest here for the way they interconnect with the broad-based coalitionary demands and goals of the reproductive justice movement, which, as I argue next, is exemplary of anti-racist feminist bioethical work. Okay. So looking back at our outline, where does this review of the issues leave us besides depressed with respect to our main question about what makes an anti-racist feminist bioethics? So here I want to take a moment to talk about the reproductive justice movement and how it can serve as an example in considering the practice of anti-racist feminist bioethics. So the reproductive justice movement is coalitional and it has been led by women of color. The reproductive justice framework uses the experiences of women of color to oppose any ethical discourses on reproduction that focus primarily or exclusively on a white middle-class woman's privacy right to make a choice about whether or not to have an abortion. A narrowly individual right to choose is inadequate to addressing the histories and present day cases of racialized reproductive inequalities described earlier. Taking these histories as crucial to the movement, the reproductive justice framework insists not only on a human right not to have children, but also on both the right to have children and the right to parent the children one has in safe and healthy environments. It also sees these rights as entailing the obligation of government and society to ensure that the conditions are suitable for implementing one's reproductive decisions requiring at, at a minimum that all reproductive choices be safe, affordable, and accessible to women. I think it is clear in this example that centering the issues of women of color does not mean ignoring the individual rights of white women, but aims in fact at improving reproductive conditions for all women. So the ethical or bioethical where it's centered on autonomy conceived in terms of uh, oops, conceived in terms of personal freedom, and especially in clinical contexts, tends to focus only on what is or is not permissible in biomedical practice, in terms of individually conceived ethical rights, duties, obligations, or prohibitions. With ethical rules in place, much of patient and physician decision making is taken to be a private matter with little relevance to politics or social justice. By contrast, an anti-racist feminist bioethics must explicitly concern itself with the political, that is social responsibility, collective life, and the power dynamics and inequalities of social orders, and the role that concepts like race have played in creating and maintaining such inequalities. To create an anti-feminist bioethics, we must insist not upon not only the necessity, but the centrality of discussions of race to the broader field. We must show that there are vital lessons to be drawn from the experiences of racial minorities for bioethics as a whole. It is not simply a matter of applying bioethical analysis to the problems of marginalized people to help them out or be more fair. Rather, it is a matter of making bioethics more genuinely universal in its scope by gathering more perspectives, not merely as a collection of incommensurable experiences, but as a means of obtaining a more comprehensive and more just view of the world. <clears throat> 
It is a matter of recognizing real deficiencies in current bioethical knowledge and correcting those deficiencies in order to develop better practices for everybody, including even those privileged persons who most closely approximate the rational autonomous individual at which much of bioethics has thus far been aimed. We must go beyond simply adding some attention to the problems lying at the margins of bioethics. We must look from the margins of bioethics toward the center in order to critique and ultimately displace that center in favor of something more expansive, more responsible, more responsive, and much more flexible. So thank you. <laughs>